Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. This is going to be a fun episode with the Director of Design and Product Development at Kuyu Ultralight Hunting, Sean Ayers. And I've had the privilege of hunting with Sean, and he's a real uh, gear uh, techie guru uh, type of guy. And I know you're going to get a lot of value out of this episode. He's going to be talking about the Kuyu backpack frames Uh, the backpacks in general. He's going to go through the whole line, talking about the carbon fiber, how it's made, the materials, uh, why Kuyu packs are the best on the market, the production of the spread toe carbon fiber, the tolerances, load carrying capabilities, functionality of the packs, uh, the power pole systems, waist belts, different design characteristics, modularity of the system, uh, load slings, and then he's going to answer a bunch of questions from the listeners And I want to encourage you guys to check out Kuyu.com, Kuyu Ultralight Hunting. Uh, And they are one of the sponsors of this podcast. That is the gear that Dara and I use for all of our hunts. And um, I I highly encourage you to check them out. Also, remember the Kuyu Mobile Showroom is in Las Vegas this week, uh, the 12th through the 14th um, of October. And soon to be in Arizona, make sure to go to Kuyu.com and check out where the Kuyu Mobile Showroom or the Kuyu World Tour is going to be uh, over the coming weeks. Uh, guys, also want to remind you, GoHunt.com Insider, the free trial uh, ends. Uh, this is your last uh, chance to get a, a 30-day free trial, 100% free uh, 30-day trial of Gohan Insider. You can look at all of the harvest data, statistics, all of the units, all the different animals in all of the states across the western U.S. All you got to do is go to the URL, go to gohunt.com forward slash jscott, follow the prompts from there, and uh, that will get you the 30-day free trial. But that is coming to an end here uh, in roughly two weeks. Uh, so make sure you jump on that. I want to thank Go Hunt Insider for their sponsorship of this podcast. They're the title sponsor. Also, Phone Scope, uh, Cheston Davis and his crew out of Beaver, Utah, uh, PhoneScope.com. Uh, you get a 10% discount if you use the J. Scott 16 promo code. And uh, I use a phone scope every day when I'm in the woods. If you are on my Instagram page and see a lot of the videos and photos, uh, most all of those are shot uh, with uh, the phone scope. They can adapt any binocular to uh, any uh, optic and uh, use that J. Scott 16 promo code and get a 10% discount. Also want to thank the guys at the Outdoorsman's, uh, Cody Nelson, uh, the Optics Authorities there, the Outdoorsman's 1-800-291-8065. Use the J. Scott promo code. You'll get a 10% discount there at the Outdoorsman's. Guys, I hope you enjoy this episode uh, with Sean. It's very in-depth. I uh, hope you learned something. And uh, thanks for your support of this podcast. Feel free to send me an email at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com or a direct message on my Instagram page. That's at J. Scott Outdoors. Appreciate all of the loyal support and keep sending in photos and success stories of this fall season. Today, uh, I want to talk you through our backpack system, which is um, a line that's uh, very dear to my heart and I spent a lot of time over the years working on it. And uh, we're going to go through all the way from the carbon fiber frame through the two different pack lines we have, the Ultra and the Icon Pro. And then we're going to try to spend a significant amount of time also just talking about um, using some of the different features, like uh, going through the load sling mode and fitting a pack properly, which is, I mean, your backpack's only as good as as the fit of that pack. And so we're going to go through that today, uh, talk about modularity and some different ways that you can use use the pack system. So... uh, yeah, and then we'll wrap it up with some questions at the end, and uh, that should be, yeah, that should be it. I appreciate everybody being here and spending your uh, spending your time. Um, thank you for that, and uh, let's dive right into the carbon fiber frame, which um, I've got one here without any webbing on it. But uh, when we're trying to decide on a material to use for our backpack system here at Kuyu, 
we wanted to try something that really hadn't been perfected before, which was using carbon fiber as a as a frame material. And carbon fiber is the material of choice if, uh, for ultralight applications where you need, have, you need a lot of flex in the material. Um, you need to be able to have the resiliency in that material to rebound from that flex. Uh, it made sense to, to design a carbon fiber frame. Uh, ultra lightweight, incredibly expensive material, but given, given our business model here at Kuyu, we thought we could bring it to market. So uh, let's talk a little bit. We've got some good video lined up for you guys on the, some of the materials that are used, which are unique to, to this frame. And Blaze has got some video of standard carbon fiber being, being made sheets and then our spread to carbon fiber. And so the standard. standard. So with a standard carbon fiber bundle or toe, it can be, it's usually an elliptical shape and there can be like 12,000 strands in that. And what happens with that material is that it's actually woven into place. And you can see that on the machine in the video right now, it's weaving that, that carbon fiber. And that gives you the distinctive look of normal carbon fiber. You see that, that checkered look. Now, okay. So each one of those rolls there has a carbon fiber, basically a toe on it. It's it's like a fiber in uh, in fabric manufacturing. And it's going into that weaving press and it's being woven above and below each each strand. So the problem with that construction is that it creates voids every time that that material ends up dropping below a strand it creates voids and that void ends up getting filled with resin and resin doesn't provide you with any benefit if it's not attached to the carbon fiber the carbon fiber it 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 just adds weight without increasing performance at all so back in 2016, we actually changed the materials that we used to this to a called a spread toe type of carbon fiber. And Blaze has got a video lined up of how that is produced, and I can talk you through what happens there. Here we go. So this is the Shomarat facility, which is back in what state, Blaze? South Carolina. In South Carolina. They take that material, what would be that toe of material that may be 12,000 strands, and they'll actually squeeze it flat. And they lay it out onto a, a sheet. And they also have the ability at that point to take that material and do multiple layers. And you can have a layer that's in one direction, and then you can switch it at a 45-degree angle. And by changing that angle of those sheets, we can increase the performance and, and change the characteristics of the frame at different locations. And so one of our major sheets on here is actually a three-ply, one on top that's straight, 45-degree angle, then another one on the bottom. So this is a, this is a, a video of that material being made. And that machine is 200 feet long, right, Blaze? Mm -hmm. yeah. So that material then is sent to our production facility, which is actually here in Sacramento, California, a place called Rocket Composites. And Paul Hewitt over there, I mean, he's been incredible to work with um, on design for us. And we've got a video of the frames actually being made over at Rocket Composites. Uh, this is a video of the material being laid out. The patterns are cut for the different size frames. We have three different size frames. The material is put into a compression mold. And... You can see the resin being applied in this video, and the compression mold presses down. It has heat involved. The heat cures the resin and squeezes out as much resin as possible. And with the spread to carbon fiber that we use, that you now have those contact. You don't have those voids the way the standard carbon fiber has, so we can squeeze out more resin. So this allowed us to make a part that is incredibly strong and keep our weights where we needed them to be. And the video now is going through some of the finishing processes uh, where they go. There's QC steps involved, um, very strict QC on weight and all the tolerances. So that's what happens prior to a backpack being being shipped over to our uh, our facility where they're they're put together and assembled. So that's that's an overview of of the construction. Uh, you have 
this part, like I said, is complex in terms of there's there's foam core in here. There's material, the spread tone material at different angles, depending on where we want flex in this. And the ideally, you want we want a part that has incredible vertical stiffness. I'm going to pull the table over. But incredible vertical stiffness, but you want a part that then moves with your body in this direction. So this is going to provide the load carrying cap capability, and this is going to provide the comfort when you're walking is having this movement. And you just can't do this with another material besides carbon fiber. You can't get aluminum or steel uh, to, to move in this, in this same way, especially at this kind of weight. So that's the frame. That's the, this is the foundation of our system. It's used across both of our pack lines. The same carbon fiber frame is in the ultras and the pros. So let's move on to the the pack lines, and we'll actually uh, first talk about the let's talk about the ultra line first. And I've got uh, an ultra six thousand right here. So our design intent with the ultra line was to keep minimize weight as much as possible, and we did that through really careful choice of our fabrics. Uh, the 330 denier fabric here has amazing tear strength, uh, but is incredibly lightweight. We minimize the pocketing. We put in just enough pocketing to be to be functional. You've still got these external pockets on it, but internally we use other ways to organize, like our, our dry bags and things like that. So there's there's minimal build in these, and we've been able to on the 6,000 cubic inch bag have this is sub four pounds, which if you look at other backpacks in the hunting industry, I mean, they may be 10 pounds. I and mean, you're talking the whole weight of a spotting scope and difference, a big spotting scope difference in weight between this bag. And like I said, we're trying to design a, a bag system that is incredibly light in weight, but still capable of carrying out a heavy load. I mean, you could absolutely, I've done it myself many times, carry out full hind, you know, hind quarters of elk in this, um, does an amazing job. And so we offer three different uh, size ultras. And they are a 6,000 cubic inch. That's your 10 day or 3,000 cubic inch. You can get a few days out of that, uh, but also it's a really good just large day pack size. And then the 1,800 size, which is a very small pack. And I can talk a little bit later about some of the capabilities of, the, of that small pack and that Ultra uh, specifically. The suspension system for the Ultras is relatively low profile, has a nice curvature to it, which some people actually prefer to the pros. Uh, the foam is designed in multi-layer foams with, with perforated holes inside to keep the weight down. So everything we did here was designed to keep the weight down as much as possible. So let's, uh, let's jump over to the jump over to the Icon Pros. Next, I want to step back on, on one item on, on, these, on these packs and just... Similar to every product that we make here at Kuyu, we choose our materials based on performance and not based on price. So we choose the best materials that we can possibly choose for to construct our backpack systems. Cordura fibers, which is an air textured nylon that's incredibly strong, nylon 6'6". You've got YKK zippers, Duraflex buckles throughout all of our pack lines. So choosing the best quality materials, I mean, that's, that's, that's our design philosophy here at Kuyu, period. No different in the backpack system, the carbon fiber frame. Um, best materials that we can possibly source for these packs. So with the, with the Icon Pros, you've got 500 den denier Cordura, extensive pocketing in this system, and it's a system that's built lots of features for guys who, or women who want to organize their gear as much as possible on a trip, uh, want the extra durability of, of, of the heavier fabrics. The suspension system on this particular pack has a larger contact area, uh, more robust silicone printing here. So it holds up, stays up on your back, heavier, heavier padding. So this suspension set in particular is the power pull system on this is there is a power pull system on the ultras also this is set up a little differently uh, with a pulley system so really can dig in and get you a nice tight fit on the on the waist belt uh, the pros 
me see how that works to put, turn this around. Um, still okay there? Yep. So the pro system, like I said, the, the large extensive pocketing throughout also internally. The, the larger pro bags have these external pockets that are great. You can put large optics in here. You can run a gun all the way through this pocket down into the butt can go all the way down into, into this pocket down here. A large tripod could go there also. Um, big horseshoe zip on the 52 and 7200, so you can lay this bag completely open when you're at camp. You have access to all your gear. So really extensive pocketing and organization uh, capabilities here. 7,200 cubic inch, that's your expedition pack, your, you know, 10 to 14 day or 5,200 cubic inch size, that's your, you know, four to six day or somewhere in that range, maybe squeeze a little more out of it. 3,200 size, awesome large day pack. If you're running big optics, uh, say you're late season, you need to carry more gear with you. If you're carrying gear for another person, 3,200, awesome day pack. And the 1850 Icon Pro, is unique in that it can be used with the carbon fiber frame and actually without the carbon fiber frame also. So you can use it just as a day pack with internal stays inside with the suspension system attached directly to the bag. And that's, that's available for purchase as, as what's called suspension only. So, uh, so those are your four, those are your four sizes of, of the pros. Uh, that basically covers it for the overview of the packs and now I'm going to jump into talking about some of the design characteristics, some of the features that like the, the load sling and the modularity of the whole system. And so let's put this, put this back down. I've got a, I've got a 3200 set up right here with, so all of our backpacks have the ability so the pack bag to move away from the frame and suspension so that you can carry meat or even gear inside between the pack bag and the frame. And that's, like I said, that's universal across, across all of our packs. It's important with this system, you've got probably 2,500 cubic inches in there or so. Uh, you can definitely get, you know, full alkyne quarter in there, no problem at all. Um, I did want to go over one thing You'll see when you get when you get a pack shipped to you that there's an extra strap on the stay of the pack. And you guys zoom in on, I don't know if you can zoom in on that. I'll try not to move it around too much. But at this location, you've got you've got an extra strap. That stay is up into this pocket on the bag. And there's an extra strap at that location. When you go into load sling mode, you need to loosen the bottom straps on the pack. The pack bag will come off of the stays and you will engage that strap that's stored at that location, we call it a bridge strap, because it then bridges the distance between the load lifter here, goes up through a hole in the top of the stay, and then goes out to the pack bag. So that's really the crux move in terms of, of getting yourself set up into, into load sling mode, um, using that bridge strap to bridge that, that distance. Uh, you can unbuckle all of these. You can lay it completely open uh, to get the meat in there or a hindquarter, for instance. Um, in terms of strapping everything back down and making sure that the load is, is being compressed properly, it's very important to keep a tighter fit on the lower end of your meat load out here versus the upper end. And what that does is it presses the bag against the frame. You should never have your big chunk of meat hanging off of the straps in the bottom. If so, you've, you, you, you don't have it compressed properly. Take it off, readjust everything. You've, got, you've literally got 10 compression points all the way around here. You can tighten those down enough to get that meat pressed against that, that frame and have it not sag. So that's basic overview of the load sling, like I said, you've got this. Every single pack is capable of doing this that we sell. So there's your there's your load sling. Uh, let's talk about modularity of of our pack system and uh, ah, just go without a prop. But uh, so with with our system, it's designed so that you can use any of the pack bags interchangeably with the frame and suspension sets. So you can use, you can have an Icon Pro suspension, you can put an Ultra bag on it. 
And, and likewise, you could have an ultra suspension, you could put an Icon Pro bag on it. And honestly, one of my favorite setups is to use a Pro suspension and then an ultra, a set of ultra bags on there. So if I'm going to somewhere in the backcountry and I know that I'm going to be setting camp for a few days and then hike, and then and then move, going out of there to hunt, I'll typically take a pro suspension. I'll take a six thousand bag, and I'll actually take a little eighteen hundred cubic inch bag, and I'll have my day hunting gear inside that eighteen hundred cubic inch bag, and then I'll shove that down right into the big cavity of of the Ultra Six Thousand. Got all my day hunting gear. It's already organized in my day pack. When I get to camp, I can just pop the big bag out. I can take out that little eighteen hundred and put it directly on my on my frame and suspension, and then. Likewise, I mean, in another scenario, I mean, I, I love the as a I love the thirty two hundred Icon Pro as a as a bag, but I almost r- always run it with an ultra suspension. Just I'm typically day hunting in that in that case. Um, I like the lower profile and feel of of that ultra suspension in that case, um, but I want the the pocketing and the organization of that Icon Icon Pro bag, and then. The times that I use the 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 full Icon Pro systems, like an Icon Pro bag, would be when going on a hunt where, say, I'm breaking down camp every single day. I'm keeping camp on my back. Um, a lot of your time is spent breaking down, setting up. You want your gear to be as organized as possible. Um, a lot of times, that situation also you've got you want your optics to be to very very available and, and easy to get to. So in that case. Absolutely love the the pro system, and uh, yeah, and all that organization is just incredible in, in that type of situation. And one other thing I want to quickly note on the on the pro system is actually with both of them, but specifically with the pro, you can take this lid off, and there's a compression panel that's built into the shroud. You can take the straps that are on the the back of this lid. You can roll the shroud up. And those those straps then go to that shroud. And you can really easily use this without without the lid. So if you're on that type of hunt where you've only taken you're only taking one pack with you, you need it to work as as a load as a big hauler. Plus you want it to work as your day pack. Get rid of the lid. Use that compression panel to to use it more as a day pack type of type of configuration. So I think that covers. What I wanted to cover in terms of overview of those two, the two lines, um, I'm going to have. Unless there's anything else you guys can think of, is there? No, I have are we one good? Que- one question. Okay. You. If you had one pack and you had to use it for every single hunt that you're going on, I know that's tough. What would it be? <laughs> just just one without without mixing the two systems. Just one without mixing. Probably an Icon Pro 5200. Okay. Yeah, I think I could do most everything with uh, with that pack, and that's one of our best sellers. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people buy that. But like I said, I I, I have the option to use whatever, so I, I end up using I end up using the, the ultras bags a lot on the pro suspensions because that's really where the weight difference is. The suspensions between the the pros and the ultras are actually relatively close together in weight. There's there's only about a three to four ounce difference between the two. So there's yeah the different the the weight difference is really in the bag. So the times I I mean. Weight is critically important when you're in these really tough mountain hunts, and so you know knocking the weight down and, and with a, a simpler bag is something that that I do a lot. So, McKay, do you want to come over and we can talk through fitting of uh, yeah. of a pack? Let's do it. So the first thing to realize: so we've have we have two different waist belt sizes that we offer. And the break points, I don't know, 33, 33 and a half inch range between the two. Smaller than that, you want to go to the small, medium. Larger than that, you want to go with the, the large XL. Um, the problem with that, yeah, the, the large hip belt on a small waist guy is you can just bottom it out and then you can't get it tight. So in terms of frame heights, we actually have three different frame heights. Um, and they're approximately equivalent to like a 22 inch, a 24 inch, and a, and a 26 inch. And we call our break points, if you, if you are relatively... Um, average build and say under 510 I'd say the regular is, is most likely where you're going to fall between you know 510 and 6 foot to 6'1 uh, then the tall so McCade here 
six foot tall, right? And somewhere in that range? We'll give myself the benefit of the doubt. Okay. On one. Okay. Yeah, uh, so I'm right there. I'm close. I've got a question on exactly this that's coming uh -huh. in. Dave Sharp yep. is saying, I'm confused as to where to measure on my back to get the correct size frame. Can you address that one for me if you don't get to it in the video? That's actually a good question. Yeah, we can add that in. I mean, we can go over how to how to measure your torso length um, after you take after you take that off. Yeah, let's, yeah. Do that. let's do that. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, I was just giving you some general guidelines in terms um, in terms of height, but you have to keep in mind in that situation that everybody's you know leg length and their torso length is different. The ideal way to do it is to really measure your torso length, and we'll and we'll go over and do that. So first thing you want to do is you want to have say twenty to thirty pounds in the, in a pack before you try to fit it on yourself. First thing you want to do is get the waist belt get the waist belt tight. And you want to put 100% of that weight onto, onto your hips. And it's very important here. Most people, a lot of people wear their hip belt too low on their body. If you feel there's, there's the top of your hip bone, it's called your, your iliac crest. And that pack hip belt should cup over the top of that iliac crest and, and it should lock itself into place. So you, are you feeling that right there? Yep. I mean, it, it should go right over the top of the iliac crest and be like almost squeezing into your into your soft part yep. of your guts. Right okay? So the next thing you want to do is do the sternum strap. Tighten the sternum strap. And don't go too tight with this because you can completely deform the shape yeah, of the... the camera okay. The yeah. So if you tighten this too much at this point, you can completely deform the shape. and you're com So just get it to the point that as you tighten things up, this isn't going to fall off your shoulders. Next thing you want to do is loosen the load lifter straps completely so there's no pressure here. Otherwise, you're going to be fighting against and, and limiting your ability to tighten this strap. So then you want to tighten down the shoulder straps. They actually look pretty tight on you already at that point. Go a little tighter. Okay. Final thing you want to do is to tighten those load lifter straps. And it's important to not over tighten those. Like I like to just just get to the point that there's a little bit of pressure on there. If you have a heavier load, you can you can add more. Like you've got them overly tight because they're you're actually causing the shoulder straps to come up on you. What a, and if you can see this, I don't know if there's a close up or. There, yeah, right there is good. So ideally, if you have the right height frame, this should be at say a 35 to 45 degree angle, and. This is called your load lifter strap. And it doesn't technically lift the load, but what it does is it releases the pressure on the top of your shoulders, which is what gets painful over time as, you, as you're using it, and it transfers that load all the way around your chest. So you can feel, as you, as you tighten that load lifter, you'll feel the pressure release here, and you'll feel the pressure tighten right there. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that? Yeah. Okay. The other thing that you want to be really careful of with this, um, once you turn sideways one more time, the placement of this load lifter attachment point. Ideally, you want this just forward of, say, the peak of, of your shoulder right here. Um, it's a little far forward on you right now, and that's why you're getting some of that gapping back there. We should actually take this off, move the shoulder straps down. Why don't you do that just real quick? Yeah. We'll, we'll, and that way we'll show the, how you can adjust the shoulder strap height. So in this case, that load lifter attachment point was too far forward on him. He had some gapping right here. So we'll want to take and move the Velcro, disengage the Velcro, slide it down. The shear strength on this, of this attachment point is provided by the Velcro, and we use a special type of Velcro that's a polyester Velcro that, that has a higher shear strength. And then you, there's a T-lock plastic part that goes into the frame back here that keeps it from shearing off the Velcro. So let's put that back on you. Concerned it might have gone a little too far, but we'll see where it falls on you Test her up and see. Yeah. So same procedure, hip belt. And you want to carry 70% of your weight or so on your on your hips. So initially when you fit it, put 100% there. Tighten these up so you get maybe 30% of that weight now back on your back on your shoulders. Uh, that's closer. You can maybe go down actually a little bit further yeah. on. I mean, you've got pretty tall, long legs, a relatively short torso for your height. Good thing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 
so yeah, this this maybe should be there ideally, but that's um, that's basically. I mean, that's a that's a pretty good that's a pretty good fit yeah. at that point. You've got a good load lifter angle. It's really functional. It's important to have this angle here and your whole load behind your back because it, it makes a massive difference in how comfortable it is to carry weight. If you get weight low on your back and, and far away from your body, it pulls over just like a fulcrum. I mean, it's, it's pulling you back. And so, I mean, this, this setup will maximize basically your comfort. And then you can adjust the tension of this load lifter depending on, you know, how your shoulders are feeling as you're, if you're carrying really heavy weights. I mean, you shouldn't need to adjust it much. I, I, I almost never adjust it when I have, you know, 45 pounds, 30 yeah. to 45, whatever I'm, you know, running as my normal, just carry weight. But, uh, but yeah, so that's, um, sometimes when you get, you know, 100 plus pounds on there, then you need to start adjusting a few things. One thing I'm going to quickly go over is don't forget the load stabilizer strap right here, especially if you've had to put the pack into load sling mode, you actually need to loosen up on these. So this should be that, this should be the very last thing that you, that you adjust and tighten up. You should have this actually, the load stabilizer actually loose when you first put the hip belt on and it should be the very last thing that you, that you tighten up. Uh, especially, like I said, after you've filled the bag or if you put something in, into the load sling here, it um, what happens is if this is overly tight, you get the lumbar pad sticking into your back and you can't get a good wrap of, of the hip belt. That'll make it extremely uncomfortable. It'll give you a lot of lumbar pain. So having um, making sure that you loosen that up. And then the final thing you want to do is, is tighten that up and that pulls that whole pack bag up onto the, onto the hip belt stabilizes the load so perfect your dial dude awesome nice steve hallmark is asking what size meat bag is that that's probably a medium that's a medium yep. yeah which is designed to fill that that size uh really well with a with a large uh for an l quarter or something uh, if you try to buy boned out meat in a large, for instance, it's going to be falling all over the place. So, yeah, that um, or this medium size quarter bag or a like the XL size uh, roll top dry bag are probably the perfect size to fill that load sling. Awesome. So let's, uh, let's measure McCade's back. Oh, yeah. that's right. Got it. So to get a torso length measurement, what you first want to do is find that, you find that iliac crest, so find that point where the top of your hip bone is, and you want to cut that with your hands like this, and rotate your hands kind of around the back. So this is like sitting right on the top of that, uh, that hip bone, and you want to draw a line from your thumbs like straight across to that point right, right there. So that's the height of your hip bone or your iliac crest. And then you want to measure up to what's called the C6, C7 vertebrae. So if you tilt your head forward, you can feel one vertebrae that really sticks out. And McCade's an anatomical disaster because <laughs> I can't find it. But it's, it's about right there. So you would measure that distance right there, and that would be your, that would be your torso length. On most people, that, that C6, C7 vertebrae really sticks out. You can see it on me, but um, that's how you measure. So you're basically drawing a line from the top of your lat crest across and then up to that C6, C7 vertebrae. So look at the sizing guidelines in the, on the website, and you guys should be able to figure out. And then definitely when you get the pack at home, put some weight in it, test it out. Make sure you get it fitted just like we showed here. Make sure you have a functional load lifter angle before you take it out and, and really abuse it. Sounds good. So, yeah, give yourself some time before the season, before your hunts. Get the pack in. Work through adjusting it correctly, getting, you know, you know all that. So. Josh Sumner is asking, what is the fix if the lumbar support is not comfortable? Uh, Icon Pro 1850. It would, it would apply to all of them. Right? Yeah. So the lumbar support, if, if it's too much to begin with, uh, it, will, it will break down over time. One thing you want to be careful of is not having those load stabilizer straps too tight. Like I said, that can pull that lumbar right into your back. Uh, it, it will soften over time. If you have the opposite problem, there's a lot of guys who are actually like more lumbar uh, pressure and we actually we actually sell each pack with a a shim that you can put in there and and basically build up that lumbar and it's important to have some lumbar pressure on a pack because we've actually we've actually tested out multiple versions of our packs with 
a less aggressive lumbar and the the hip belt really sags down on your butt and doesn't hold the weight up high and so it's important to have some good lumbar pressure there and, and to be pressing that that silicone print into your back another question yep uh, Brian Ratcliffe, do you have a pack that will accommodate a holster for a pistol on the belt? Most packs have large belts with a pocket, which makes packing a pistol impossible. Yes, this one's easy to answer. And we'll cover this. I think we're going to do another one of these where we actually go over all of the pack accessories. But our hip belt was specifically designed with... You can zoom in on... Let me see if I can turn it here. So this strap right here is completely removable, and it's also, you can open it up and you can slide a gun on. So you can take this hip belt pocket off, and then you would just have, that's actually the base configuration, the way this is sold, would be, would be the, the hip belt, and then would have this one and a half inch webbing strap. And you can put bear spray on there, you can put gun spray, you can put uh, our rangefinder holder, or I use it as a camera case, will fit right here. I can actually get my 44 mag in this location right here behind this pocket, especially if I shift that pocket up a little bit, and I'll, I'll carry it right there. Um, having this completely removable, you can also run just a completely a completely clean strap if you don't want, you know, if it bugs you to have your arms hitting the, the hip belt pocket, you can run this thing completely clean. So you can do anything you want here, and you can carry any accessory, basically, at that location. Let's answer a couple questions coming in from Instagram. Uh, this one came in from Matthew underscore Davis 24, and he asked, what pack do you recommend on a DIY moose hunt? I think that's going to be hard not knowing the days, but let's say it's a seven-dayer. A DIY, yeah, a DIY moose hunt. I would probably take the Dicon Pro 7200 in that case. Uh, we have, depending on the size of the bull, I mean, we have had full moose hind quarters actually inside of that bag before uh it would just be a i think it would be good to have um the more robust system on on a moose hunt i mean typically on a moose hunt i mean you're, you you've got um you know some kind of big you know freighter pack or something like that you know for packing but hell i mean there's guys doing it every year multiple times a year i'm going moose hunting next year um i'm planning on doing all my packing with our packs so yeah it's uh, i know they can do it no problem at all i mean yeah next question uh, this one came in from G. Malone forty three, and he asked for hike in day hunts. Do you recommend carrying camp on a load shelf with eighteen fifty or thirty two hundred icon pack, or do you think it's better? Or do you think your way of packing the day pack is better? So, I mean, if I'm doing just so, it was just hike in like um, on day hunts, or was he going? Repeat the question one more time. Yeah, let's see. So, I think he means setting a spike camp. Okay, so exactly. if I yeah, if I'm doing my my preference, if I'm doing just one to two nights out, is to use one of the three thousand cubic inch. That would be either the Ultra or the thirty two hundred Pro, and I can get all my gear in there. And if I'm going, if depending on how cold it is, how much gear I have, how my, big my optics are, sometimes I use like one of our pack accessory pouches to put food on the outside, for instance. Or there's some different ways that you can config, configure it, and and all. And we can go over that on another live uh, feed at another time. But yeah, uh, 3,000 to 3,200 would be my choice for, for that situation, definitely. Next. Let's see, uh, what about a pack system for a five-day mule deer hunt? And that came in from josh.czyz. So mule deer hunts, I, I almost always end up using the, um, the ultra packs. Just you're typically, I mean, a lot of times on a mule deer hunt, I mean, you're you're covering, you know, huge elevation gain can be in some really gnarly country uh, uh, that that's the time when I really pay attention to weight. And if, like I said, if in that situation, if I'm going in, I'm setting a spike camp, for instance, I'll, I, I will I will use um, like a big six thousand and bring a smaller day pack along with me. But, yeah, usually usually I end, end up going with the with the ultras for for a mule deer type of hunt. Uh, this question came in a couple times, actually, uh, once on Facebook and once on once on Instagram. Uh, and it was, what are the straps slash buckles right on top of the frame stays? I think it means the bridge straps. Yeah, so that's, um, yeah, we already covered that. So those, those are these straps. And they're just, with the, when we ship you the pack, they're just stored 
at that location. They're shoved into that into that pocket. You can take them out and put them in a in an internal pocket if you want. I just leave mine there, and and, and then it's there when I need it. Um, so yeah, they're just stored at that location. So it's really important. Um, you know, like I said, when you when you set that up, frame stay comes out of that pocket, bridge strap gets engaged, and then what I see guys doing a lot. It's really important to re-engage it properly. So remember that your load lifter on on the larger bags from thirty two hundred or three thousand up in size, this load lifter buckle right here needs to be attached to your pack bag. Um, don't put this back into don't put it back into the frame pocket like this. Because there's nothing that's going to support the back end of that, and that'll just slide out, and you won't have any functional load lifters mm -hmm. at that point. Uh, this question comes in a lot, uh, and this one came in from Mission Alaska on Instagram, and they asked, "How do you keep the pockets on the bag from coming off the posts?" That's a that's a that's a really good question, also, and and we see this as um, with the latest version of the packs. We've changed all of the attachment points on the back end to buckles, but previously they just attached to webbing loops. So it's it's really important that the what's called the bag attachment strap, which is this strap that comes off of the hip belt and goes up to the bag, it needs to be attached to the webbing loop that's like four inches up the back of the bag and not to this one. If it's attached to this one, Especially with a regular size frame, there's nothing that's pulling that frame into that pocket. So I hope that's clear and answers that question. Awesome. I think we have time for one more. Uh, and this one came in from Dakota Ewart. And he asked, what is the main difference between the Icon Pro and Ultra Pack line? Like I said, I mean, it's, there's, a lot of differences, and a lot of them are, are are hard to see. But it's all the way down to fabrics, the seam construction, the pocketing, the internal foam structure. There's a lot of things that make it that make it different. Um, like I said, the the ultras designed to be as light as we could possibly make it, but still have a pack that was capable of carrying heavy loads. The ultras, that's more your Cadillac line. I mean, you got lots of lots of um, pocketing for organization, heavy duty fabrics, larger. Uh, contact area of the whole suspension system, bigger foam. I mean, it's just a more robustly built system in general. So it's a choice between the kind of hunts you're doing, whether weight's really um, weight savings is really important, or whether you want to have the ability to really organize your gear. And so that's hopefully that answers that question. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Is that it? That's it. All right, guys. Um, that was actually fun. I, I really appreciate uh, all your guys' time. And uh, we're going to start doing this more regularly. Uh, and if you guys have any suggestions on topics to cover, uh, hit McCade up uh, with a direct message on Instagram or Facebook. And we'll cover the items that, uh, that you guys want to cover. And, and happy to share with you guys just, I mean transparency is our deal here, right? I mean, we, we, we're willing to talk about all of the materials in our in our system in our clothing in our packs because we don't have anything to hide i mean we, we use the best that we can we can possibly source anywhere so um that's that's it and uh thank you all for your time and uh hey one thing also i mean if you guys are give feedback for product development or the design group i read it all and and i love to see it and we try to incorporate and, and evolve our products and improve them as much as we can. So, I mean, keep sending those things into customer service. They get to me. Uh, I, I read them. I read them all. Uh, things that go into warranty, stuff like, you know, all, that's, that's all gets back. And, and, and believe me, your voice is being heard on all of that. So, so thank you very much. It was fun hosting today. And uh, that's a wrap.